prophet is one vocation, one calling of many different callings. Uh, even even a, a woman who is a mother is not only a mother. She has many different callings to be a wife, to be a, to be a church member. Uh, sometimes there's other kinds of work that are involved in her life. Uh, there's many different types of callings. And a number of the things that I'm going to say have some reflection in other vocations as well. And in addition to that, uh, the church needs, I think to have the right view of motherhood, because according to the Bible, motherhood is essential. Now, not everyone's called to be a mother, but motherhood is essential for the health of the church and for the health of the world. Let me say that again. Motherhood is essential for the health of the church and for the health of the world. So whether or not anyone's a mother, this is a topic where every Christian needs to have a biblical understanding. We need to understand God's value, God's design for motherhood so that either if we're a young person, we can honor our mother, or if we're a father or a husband, we can support and encourage the mother of our children, or if we're an empty nester, we can encourage our, our children maybe who are becoming mothers on their own. All of us have some connection, some relationship to someone who is in this calling, and this calling is essential for the health of the church and the health of the world. And so we we need, whether we're mothers or not, we need to have a right biblical understanding of this, and insufficient understandings abound of motherhood. Perhaps you've heard uh, maybe of the (laughs) the questions that a number of second graders were asked about mothers. They went like this. Why did God make mothers? One person answered, she's the only one who knows where the scotch tape is. What ingredients are mothers made of? God makes mothers out of clouds and angel hair and everything nice in the world and one dab of mean. Why did God give you your mother and not some other mom? First answer, we're related. (laughs) Second answer, God knew she likes me a lot more than other people's moms like me. (laughs) What did mom need to know about dad before she married him? She had to know his background. Like, is he a crook? Does he make at least $800 a year? Did he say no to drugs and yes to chores? <laughs> what kind of little girl was your mom? I don't know because I wasn't there, but my guess would be pretty bossy. <laughs> and the final answer, they say she used to be nice. <laughs> oh my heavens. <laughs> I mean, insufficient views of motherhood abound in the childhood set, but they also abound, don't they, in the world. They abound in the world. The world often views motherhood as a necessary inconvenience, a fringe and perhaps surprising passion of a few, and a necessary and perhaps interesting experience for many but perhaps not the most efficient way to run the world. Increasingly, it is viewed as an extra to a lifetime of vision and values. And interestingly, sometimes the most inaccurate views of motherhood are found in the quiet echo chamber of a mother's own heart. Sometimes a mother's own heart is the echo chamber of the most inaccurate and damaging and dangerous views of motherhood. Her own inner voice, and that's true of mothers with young children who battle the monotony of everyday life. That's true of empty nesters who look back on their motherhood years and ask questions about their faithfulness. That's true of grandmothers evaluating the current legacy they're being left to their grown children who are mothers. Sometimes the echo chamber of a mother's own heart proves to be a damaging and unhelpful voice when it comes to motherhood. So what do we need? We need God's word to teach us about the value and the glory and the honor of this role, which is essential to the health of the church and the health of the world. 
And fathers and sons and daughters and grandmothers and singles all need to have this doctrine right so that they can contribute in their own way to the continued health of God's vision for motherhood being present in the church. I want to give four values. Now, the list could have been endless, really. But I just want to give four values about motherhood, that their motives and their reasons why motherhood is as essential and glorious as it is. Four values, okay? Four values for motherhood. And they're all going to be shaped in terms of God because everything centers around him. First of all, the image of of God. Value number one, the image of God. Why is motherhood valuable and important? Number one, the image of God. Genesis 2, you can turn there if you want, but I'm going to reference a lot of scriptures that will be behind me on the screen. The image of God. Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What this means is that children, every child is the image bearer of God, of all of God's creation, of all of the wondrous things that the Lord God made on this earth. Only children, only people, men and women, represent God as his very image, as the the representatives, the authoritative representatives of God Almighty. Man and woman have that sole place. So every child, every child that is back there in the children's ministry area, every child that you care for is an image bearer of God. They were made to stand in for the Lord and to represent him on this earth. And there are no exceptions. Every child, regardless of their background, of their intellectual level, of their social skills, of their interests and passions, all of them represent some facet of God such that they are his image bearer. Now, we all know that because of sin, that image is marred, it is distorted, it is broken, but it is not lost so that every child represents the God who made him or her. Now, why does this matter for mothers? Mothers are given the care of the most valuable thing on earth, the image of God. Mothers are called in a way that even fathers are not. And certainly in many of these cases, fathers have some application here. But even in a way fathers are not, mothers are called in a personal and intimate and ongoing nurturing way to the caretaking, the stewardship of the image of God. And according to God, there is nothing more valuable than his image on this earth. And though it is marred and defaced, it is still there, the image of God. So that your child that you hold, that you you carry and bear, if you're a natural mother, if you're an adoptive mother, that you watch over, that you protect, this is none other than God's image on this earth. God's representative to this earth. In a particular way, to show forth what he is like in a certain limited way. In a way that none of the animals are, in a way that none of the natural creation is People represent God. Every time you feed, comfort, help, remind, correct, warn, encourage, or bless your child, you are upholding one who is intended by God to reflect him in this creation. Your child has the imprint of the creator. Motherhood is the the personal stewarding of one born with the mission, born with the mission to represent God. Now, I know there are many godly callings. There are many godly vocations. I do not mean in any way to minimize other godly vocations. But I'm pointing out that there is certainly no vocation more honorable, certainly no vocation more uh, sacred than this vocation of carrying 
and watching over the very image of God. There is no calling or contribution to this earth more valuable than that. The image of God. Value of motherhood number one. The care of God. Value number two. Let me read a number of, of scriptures that I think if we, if we allow them to strike us, they are frankly astonishing. Psalm 131.2 says, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. So when David looks at God... The best comparison he can make to this particular attribute of God is a mother with her child. So that motherhood is this intended reflection of the care of God. It's not just that the, the child is valuable because it's the image of God. It's that the actual care expressed towards that child represents God himself. And motherhood, in a unique way, represents what God is like. God is the original. He didn't create mothers and then say, well, interestingly, that looks like me. No, he knew what he was like, and he created motherhood to reflect that. Listen to this from Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. What, what's the point there? The, the point is, David reaches to the most obvious, most extreme certainty of care that he can find. And what, where, does he, where does he find in that extreme place? When he goes to the end of certain and definite care, what does he find? A mother with her infant. He's saying, the, the most profound example I can give of certain and sure and tender care is a mother with her infant. I, I can't come up with a, a better example of personal and definite care than that. And he says, since that is the peak, let me point out that God goes even beyond that. It, it's possible, and, in, and you can get the, the feeling from David. It, it, wouldn't it be so unlikely and yet possible in a fallen world? But, but the point is, look, the, the extreme of care to represent God that I can get to is a mother caring for her child. And, of course, even God goes beyond even that because it's possible that could be broken in a fallen world. God, God is beyond mothers. Mothers are not the perfect reflection of God. But the point is, there's nothing that better reflects the care of God than a mother. When David's reaching for that greatest example, what does he find? A mother caring for her child. Isaiah 66, 13 makes the same point. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. If you want to know what God is like, God says, look at a mother comforting her child. That's what I'm like. I read a quote this week uh, by Luther. You've got to love Luther. I mean, what a guy he must have been to be around. But, but Martin Luther, and, and he said, when you watch a woman caring for, this is a paraphrase, when you watch a woman caring for her infant and, and laying him down, and then you see a man do the same thing, you look at the man, it's as though it's a camel dancing. And you look at the mother, and it's this perfect expression. He's saying, look, there's just something glorious and beautiful about the way God has made this mother to care for her child. And God says, I made that so that you could know what I am like. Even Paul uses this example when he's trying to, to, to demonstrate, how, how have I cared for you pastorally? What's the greatest example I can give of representing God's care for you as a pastor? Well, it's a mother, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7. But we were gentle among you. Like what? Like what, Paul? What's the best example? Like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So this tender care of a mother that moment by moment watches over this child that is there for its well-being and its nourishment and its sustenance, that's what God is like. Now here's why this is so valuable. Motherhood represents the care of God. The, the, the Bible depends, if, if I can use this, almost seems almost... <laughs> Disrespectful to say, but it's in God's word. The Bible depends on the everyday, commonplace knowledge of motherhood 
as an example for pointing people to what God is like. If mothers are not caring and sustaining and loving their children, then these passages don't make any sense. God has, as it were, staked his own reputation on motherhood. Is there any more honorable and noble calling than that? So that, mothers, when you are caring for your child, God himself intends to be represented in that act. And it's not just that it's representing God. Actually, actually more than that, it's more than simply a reflection. Listen to this quote by Martin Luther. God could easily give you grain and fruit without your plowing and planting. He's talking about means that God uses. But he does not want to do so. What else is all our work to God, whether in the fields, in the garden, in the city, in the house, in war, or in government, but just such a child's performance? In other words, God doesn't actually need any of these things to accomplish his will. God doesn't need any of these things. But these are things that he calls us to do as, as, would, as it were, a child's performance by which he wants to give his gifts in the field, at home, and everywhere else. Listen to this. These are the masks of God behind which he wants to remain concealed and do all things. He wants to remain concealed and do all things. In all our doings, he is to work through us, and he alone shall have the glory from it. So it's not just that motherhood reflects the care of God, it's that God is actually caring through the efforts of a mother. The mother is the mask of God himself, caring for this child. God himself is caring through the efforts of the mother. Since God wants to care for children, since God wants to help children, since God wants to watch over children, what does he do? He puts on the mask of your efforts in mothering, and through you, he cares for them. Mothers, you are the reflection and indeed the instrument of the care of God for his creation, your child. You reflected his care in your womb, those of you who are natural mothers, and those of you who have been pregnant and given birth, and all of you, adoptive and birth mothers alike, reflect his care toward those who are weak and helpless and defenseless and ignorant, so that the Lord expresses his own gentle nature through you. Remarkable, the care of God revealed in motherhood. Third, the gospel of God. The gospel of God. We know from the book of Proverbs and elsewhere that a primary role, probably the primary role of the mother is to teach her children. To teach them. The son of Proverbs, the kind of analogical son in Proverbs, he's told, listen to your mother's instruction. Make it a, a, an honor, a, a pendant around your neck. In other words, something to hold forth with glory and, and a sense of respect and privilege that I have received my mother's teaching. So the mother teaches the wisdom of God into the ears of this little image bearer so that he can faithfully do what he or she is called to do. Mothers, Charles Spurgeon said, the godly training of your offspring is your first and most pressing duty. Christian women, by teaching children the Holy Scriptures, are as much fulfilling their part for the Lord, listen to this, as Moses in judging Israel or Solomon in building the temple. They are as much fulfilling their part for the Lord as Moses in judging Israel or Solomon in building the temple. Why? Because God uses means and he uses you to teach wisdom to your children. Proverbs makes it clear that folly is bound up in the heart of a child. Every mother knows that explicitly. Though they were made in the image of God, sin entices them to love foolishness rather than wisdom. And the only way they can receive wisdom is if some representative of the Lord brings it to them. 
Now, certainly mothers are called to teach the wisdom of God in all of its facets and dimensions to their children, but the center and culmination of that wisdom is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of God is a great motive and value of motherhood, perhaps because it's the chief calling of motherhood to teach, and the chief subject of her teaching is the greatest expression of God's wisdom. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 22 through 25, and read this through the filter of motherhood. Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom, and certainly that is present in our world. Impress me and show me my, some human wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. In other words, it cannot be known by human wisdom. My child, your child, cannot come to the knowledge of the cross on their own. They have the, the ignorance of the gospel that is hardwired into them. And so what do they need? They need someone to bring them that wisdom, Christ, that is the power of God and the wisdom of God for the foolishness of God, namely Christ, is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In other words, what we teach is something that no human being can come to on their own. Even the wisest, even the strongest cannot come to the place of understanding the greatest wisdom present in the world, that of Jesus Christ crucified and redeeming his people. And we see this explicitly in the story of Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. Paul says to Timothy, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And listen, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, now, now mothers and the rest of us who are called to support and encourage mothers, what kind of privilege is this? What kind of privilege is this? Every child born is at enmity with God and is vulnerable to the wisdom of this world. They cannot attain to God on their own. Sin is not taught by mothers, but mothers can teach the way to be rescued from sin. Disobedience is not something that mothers train into their children, but they can train them to memorize the truth that God gives grace to the disobedient if they turn to him in repentance and faith. To be the vessel of God's wisdom into the hearts of these little men and little women is an immense privilege, an eternal honor. Eternal because only heaven can fully know the value of Jesus Christ crucified and risen. And yet every day, every week, every month, Christian mothers deliver this truth into the ears of their children. Christian motherhood is handed the most valuable message in the world to deliver in person to the most precious audience in the world. There is no more glorious calling than that. Christ crucified into the hearts of someone who, without that message, will face God's judgment. Now, all of us have this treasure, as as Paul says, in jars of clay. We all feel our weakness in body and mind and spirit, and on our own, we are not up to the task. And every mother I've ever met has this experience of feeling that their natural abilities and strength is not equal to the glory of their calling to bring the gospel to their children. What mother doesn't feel their limitations of speech and of physical strength and character to to, to fulfill this calling, to bring the gospel to bear into this little heart? Every mother I know feels that limitation. Their hearts are hard. It is sometimes like speaking to a rock. And that's discouraging. Look, don't be discouraged when you feel that way. Even Moses failed the test to speak to a rock. Even the mighty Moses, when he was told, go, preach to that rock, and it will open up life-giving water. 
Well, motherhood are told the exact same thing. So even mighty Moses facing that task found himself doubting. It is no wonder that mothers find themselves doubting when they're told to speak to the rock that is their child's heart, and they wonder whether their words are doing any good. And yet, Paul says that God has chosen our limitations so that the glory of the gospel could shine more brightly, so that in the end, mothers or fathers or pastors or anybody would not receive the glory when there is the surprising redemption that takes place when a sinner turns to the Lord. Paul says this, I think, a passage that is so valuable for mothers, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. Why? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Couldn't you apply that to mothers, certainly in seasons of motherhood? Isn't that true that we have this treasure, I have this gospel, it's more valuable than anything else, the wisdom of God contained in the message of Jesus Christ. I want to give it to you, but I'm weak, and I'm still sinful, and I'm limited, and I don't have the right words in the right moment, and I, I miss that moment, and I get this moment wrong, and I, I feel my, my clayness. Why? To show that the power of belongs to God and not to you so that it is this shocking surprise of motherhood are you afflicted in many ways yes but somehow not crushed are you perplexed have you ever felt perplexed as a mother what mother has not felt perplexed what do I do with this child Lord what mother has not felt perplexed perplexed he says but not driven to despair Persecuted? Absolutely. What mother hasn't experienced the persecution of their own child rejecting the message of the gospel? Persecuted, but, but, but not forsaken of God. Struck down? Oh, yes. Many, many mothers I know have seasons of being struck down, but not destroyed. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Motherhood is filled, I think, with a kind of quiet desperation for the souls of their children. They have an awareness of limited strength, sometimes perplexed, uh, perplexed, sometimes afflicted, sometimes persecuted. But in our weakness, the value of the gospel shines brightly so that any fruit, any fruit that comes from your ministry of motherhood allows the power of God to be revealed. to quote the scriptures to them so that you bear witness to Jesus who offered himself as a substitute for those who disobey their parents and lie and cheat and scream and hit and rebel, to offer them the offer of God, eternal life in the face of their sin. This is a privilege. You are on the edge, on the front lines of the camp of the enemy, shouting out the offer of the king that forgiveness is available to rebels. Your job is not to raise sinless children, but to teach sinners that there is hope for them in Christ. You train their character absolutely, but their character will always fall short. Their sin will never be surprising. What is surprising is that aware as you are of their sin, you can, like God, offer them love in the face of their enmity from God himself. Your children of the countless millions in the world who do not have this gift have their own mother 
to tell them the truth about who made them and how their sins can be forgiven. So that all the force of motherly influence comes to bear on the gospel for your child. I have often thought that children who are born in godly homes, even if they rebel, are the most miserable people in the world because they have the voice of their mother telling them that everything they're trying to enjoy will actually destroy them. Unlike those who are in the world who don't have that voice and are blissfully ignorant to enjoy the pleasures of sin, Christian home children grow up hearing the voice of their mother saying, and for that God will judge you. And his love and mercy is much better than any of the pleasures of this world. So every step they take toward the pleasures of sin, they have the voice of their own mother ringing into their heads, oh, this is not the right way to go. What about the most miserable people in the world? Delightfully miserable because the only joy they can really find is in Jesus Christ. This is your greatest job. And there is no greater calling than to give the gospel of Jesus Christ to the little ones that he welcomed to himself. Mothers, let me encourage you and and try to motivate you. Keep the fires of gospel passion alive in your own soul. You will not teach what you do not love. If what you love most is mature children, that is what you will teach most. If what you love most is the gospel, that is what you will teach most. I I am all for character training and and godliness training, definitely in order in the home and creativity and academic excellence and any number of other things that mothers contribute to. But I, I believe we should be most for the value of Jesus Christ. So mothers, keep the fires of gospel passion burning in your own soul. You will teach most and best what you love most. So you cannot serve your children better than to seize time to invest in preaching the gospel to yourself. And what I mean by that is taking time quietly before God and reviewing the facts that you were a sinner and Christ died for you, that you were lost and now you are found, that you were judged and now you're forgiven. Just reviewing those facts over and over again until the miracle of them begins to warm your heart again. And so they're not just facts, they're passions. So keep thinking about the gospel until they're not just facts, they're passions, so that you can bring your passions about Christ into the ears of your children. So that when you see them sinning, your thought is not, I can't believe they've done this again. It's that this is a moment to remind them it's a good thing that they have a Savior. So that when you sin, your first thought is not, I've ruined my child. But this is a moment to remind them that like them, their mother needs a savior. So that the gospel opportunities are the way you view the failures of yourself and your child. You won't do it that way if the gospel is not burning brightly in your soul. You'll think primarily of order and character and development and worldly success. But make the gospel fire burning in your soul. And then what will happen? Then you'll see every moment as a gospel moment gospel of God, the privilege of motherhood. Preach the gospel to yourself in the midst of your mothering so that it always holds chief place in your counsel to your child. Finally, the glory of God. Of course, the glory of God undergirds all of the first three But but it's worth pointing out that the fact that we are headed towards the visible experience of the glory of God is what finally gives value to any and every vocation. It's possible, I think, for fathers and mothers and singles and engineers and doctors and nurses and teachers to focus on the the earthly benefits of their work. And there are important earthly benefits of their work. We, We just referenced the care of God who loves the just and the unjust and cares for them. Yes, but the final goal, the ultimate goal of all of our vocations, and motherhood included, is that in them we prove the grace of the Lord Jesus in us and show ourselves to be headed towards a sight of God's glory. You are mothering because you are headed to glory. 
You are caring for children because you are headed to glory. And your mothering, your vocation of mothering, is one of the ways that you demonstrate the reality of the gospel in your heart, and that gospel will bring you into a sight of God in all his glory. Listen to Paul's prayer in 2 Thessalonians 1. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. And if you can't see mothering and fathering and engineering and the single life and years in that, every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. Let me encourage you to see your calling in that phrase so that, what's the goal? The name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, so that it is God's glory, and since it is God's glory, it is to your glory to fulfill your calling. And where there is difficulty, we can read 2 Corinthians 4. For this light momentary affliction, what's it doing? It's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen... Not to the things that are seen. Our final goal is not things that are seen. It's not the human success of our children. It's not having children that are more godly than other children. It's not having children that have a socially acceptable life. It's not things that are seen. Not in the end. Not finally it's not things that are seen. You don't mother finally for your children. You mother finally for God. What a, what a deliverance that is. How, how many mothers assume they're mothering for their children to become a certain thing as the end goal? And then if they don't become that, they're, they're driven to despair and hopelessness and regret. And yet in the end, it is our mothering or fathering or vocation. What are they done? For the Lord. We don't look finally to things that are seen. We look finally to things that are unseen. For the things good and bad that are seen are transient. But the things that are unseen eternal. And this is our goal in Revelation 22. John says, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, in the city. And his servants, including mothers, those who have served him, those who have served God, those who have given their lives to serve God, God, looking to the things that are unseen, those who have served God with diapers and education and correction and warning and comfort and wiping tears away and prayer and wisdom and counsel and hope and tears, those who have served God, what is their end? They will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. Oh, isn't that a good news for mothers? There will be no more night. Sleepless, wakeful nights will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. On this earth, God's glory is obscured. We believe it by faith. We serve without truly knowing and seeing the goal of our labors. We're trusting God that he is truly glorious beyond our imagination, and that one day we will be allowed to enjoy that glory. Our vocation, every vocation, every calling, and, and all of us have multiple callings. Every calling, is, it's a stewardship. It, it's held in trust before the Lord so that when he returns and takes his servants home who have given their best effort in faith, in good faith, to that stewardship, he will welcome those who have followed him into sharing the sight of his majesty. By the grace of the Lord Jesus... 
sinners who by grace have become imperfect servants will receive the well done and the reward of sharing in the sight of his eternal glory. One side of which will be beyond all comparison to the afflictions and difficulties of every vocation. And he will give us that sight without end. Mothering requires constantly forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Does it not? It requires believing that the slight momentary affliction of this life is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. Mothers, don't get distracted by the desired glories of this life or even the success of your children. Keep your eyes on the glories of God that awaits you in eternity. Listen, mothering is essential for the health of the church and the health of the world. The church of the next generation will be desperately dependent on Christians who heard the gospel first from their mothers. And there will be others, of course, who are rescued and brought into the church. But certainly, those children will be necessary and the church will depend on them. And certainly, the world will depend on those who are raised to work hard and serve their neighbors in faithful ways in various vocations. But beyond all those practical benefits, you look to the glory of your God and know that every good and faithful effort that you give in your mothering will finally lead you by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to the day when your mothering will end and the sight of his glory will begin without end. Why is mothering valuable? Because you're carrying the image of God. Because you're representing and being the care of God. You are the mask of God toward these children because you are the steward of the message of Christ. And because in the end, mothering, like every godly vocation, leads us on this pilgrimage that will end when the gates open and we will see his face and all of our endurance will seem like slight, momentary nothingness in comparison to him. May the Lord bless and keep every mother and present you on that day full of joy receiving your reward of his glory. It is our honor as fathers and sisters and sisters in Christ and brothers in Christ and children and grandparents to urge you on and to walk with you in your calling and saying there is no more glorious calling than this. And do not be discouraged and receive the joy of the honor of your particular calling so that God may be glorified in you and you in him. Let's pray. Lord, I want to pray for, first of all, mothers with young children. I pray you would strengthen them, give them Faith in the things unseen. Lord, I pray for mothers with sick children that you would heal the sick. Lord, make them well in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for mothers with wandering children. I pray you would transform their heart and rescue them from the allurements of sin. I pray for mothers with adult children, Lord, who spend their mothering efforts mostly in prayer. I pray you would comfort and encourage them and keep them and bless their joy. But I pray for mothers who battle regret, that you would remind them, Lord, our sins, they are many, 
but your mercy is more. Lord, I pray for grandmothers that they would receive, even in this life, a, a certain reward of their labors. And the blessing and honor of seeing, Lord, their children walk with you. Would you please save all children represented here? Lord, I pray for those who want to be mothers and are not. Lord, your will is perfect, but Lord, if possible, we would pray you would fulfill that desire. Lord Jesus, our hearts are with them, and we pray you would answer their prayers. Lord, I pray for fathers and sons and daughters and sisters and brothers that you would give us boldness and encouragement that we would speak grace into the hearts of our wives and sisters and mothers and grandmothers and friends, that we would urge them on, that we would be louder than the voice of their angry children, the voice of this world, or even the voice of doubt in their own hearts, that our voices would be louder speaking the truth of God's word to them and urging them onward. Give us the grace of encouragement. I pray, Lord, bless our church. Bless the mothers, bless the children, bless fathers and singles and grandmothers and grandfathers. Fill us with joy in you and the calling that we have to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Mothers, we love you, and grandmothers as well. Please receive our affection and gratefulness. It is an honor, a true honor, to walk alongside you. If for any reason we can pray for you, and I particularly have in my heart anyone uh, who is burdened, in a particular way for some child, whether it be health challenges or spiritual challenges, some needs, and you would like to just take a minute and just intercede for them together, um, I'll be down here, Aaron will be down here, the community group leaders and their wives will be down here. We just would love to pray for you for a moment, um, but also we know that there's probably Mother's Day lunches to get to, so we pray those would be a blessing to you. And we will see you either at community group or next Sunday. Don't forget last Sunday to register for the youth reunion. Uh, it's in there in the back. And look for that VBS email this week. God be with you. We'll see you next Sunday.